Good morning. We pray that you have a good Sunday today. Thank you for joining us in our Sunday morning Bible class. This morning we're going to discuss some lessons that we can learn from the book of Joshua. We're going to be in Joshua chapter 5 and chapter 6. So if you'll open your Bibles to Joshua chapter 5 and also chapter 6, we'll be reading from several verses in those chapters. We can learn a great deal about Jericho and about the Israelites and about God as they work together to conquer the city of Jericho when they came into the land of Canaan. <clears throat> Excuse me. Jericho is referred to as a city of palms. <clears throat> In Deuteronomy chapter 34, verse 3, it's called the city of palms. If you've been to Jericho, you'll see a number of palm trees that are there. Several years ago, I had the privilege of visiting Jericho. It's a very interesting archaeological site, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in just a moment. Jericho is mentioned 59 times in the Bible, 53 times in the Old Testament, including 12 times from uh, before the book of Joshua, as well as six times in the New Testament. In Joshua, we learn that Jericho was the first city that had to be taken in order for Israel to begin its conquest of the promised land west of the Jordan. We see that in chapter 2. <clears throat> this morning, let's take a look at some of the geographical and historical information about Jericho, as well as some lessons that we can learn from the biblical accounts of Jericho's defeat. <clears throat> Excavations show that Jericho is one of the oldest settlements dating back to about 9,000 BC, having the oldest known protective wall in the world. Now Jericho is located in the Jordan River Plain, about five miles west of where Israel crossed the river on dry land as they came into the land of Canaan. We read that in Joshua chapter 3, verse 16. Jericho was surrounded by a great earthen embankment with a stone retaining wall at its base that was around 15, 12 to 15 feet high. Now, on top of that was a mud brick wall, six feet thick, 20 to 26 feet high. And at the top of that embankment, roughly 46 feet above the ground level outside the lower retaining wall, was a mud brick wall similar to the other. Now these walls loomed high above Israel. Although you will uh, find slight differences, of course, in the estimation of these walls and their dimensions, the design is known and the importance of such daunting defenses cannot be reasonably denied. The area within the upper city, the fortification system, was about nine acres. So you have about nine acres of land that really is where the people that lived in the city of Jericho, only nine acres. And that upper area would hold anywhere between 1,200 to 1,800 people. Though research has now shown that people lived on the embankment between the walls and on the walls around uh, Jericho, several thousand within the walls, of course, at that time of Israel's attack. Notice again, you have the city of Jericho, about nine acres. You also have caves to the west toward Jerusalem of Jericho. And when they heard that the Aparu, as the archaeologists referred to, or the Hebrews, the Israelites, were coming, and what God had done for them by crossing the Jordan River and by uh, crossing the Red Sea and coming out of Egypt, people would begin to be afraid. And when the Israelites encamped just outside of Jericho, you had people living in caves that came out of those caves and came to the city of Jericho. So you have the city of Jericho, you have the first retaining wall, then you have a piece of land that slopes down and another retaining wall, upper wall and lower wall. And it's between these two walls, probably on this last retaining wall next to the ground level, is more than likely where Rahab lived. 
with her and her family and her relatives. We'll see that in just a little while. So here you have Jericho. It's about to be under attack by the Israelites. So let's look at some lessons from Jericho's defeat. Jericho's defeat is a lesson, I believe, of God's grace. First of all, Jericho was to be defeated by God's heavenly army, not Israel. Now, how do we know this? Because of a most unusual event that took place just before Israel and the, uh, as before they engaged uh, with Jericho. Notice chapter 5 of Joshua. Notice verses 13 through 15. And it came to pass when Joshua was by Jericho that he lifted his eyes up and looked. And behold, a man stood opposite him with his sword drawn in his hand. And Joshua went to him and said to him, Are you for us or for our adversaries? Verse 14. So he said, No, but as commander of the army of the Lord, I have not come. I have now come. And Joshua fell on his face on the earth and worshipped him and said to him, What does the Lord say to his servant? Then the commander of the Lord's army said to Joshua, Take your sandal off your feet, for the place where you stand is holy. And Joshua did so. Here's a man with a sword drawn, appears to Joshua, and tells him that he has come now as the captain or the commander of the host, the army of the Lord. <clears throat> that he had a drawn sword indicates that there was going to be a fight. But being divine, divine judgment, on behalf of the cause of God and his people, God's holiness demanding that Joshua remove his shoes uh, preceding his leading Israel against Jericho. And I believe this is reminiscent of God's holiness at the burning bush, you remember back in the book of Exodus, where the same was demanded of Moses, preceding God's promise to deliver Israel out of the Egyptian bondage, with Moses leading the way. So I have no doubt that we are to gain from this that God would bring victory to the Israelites. Jericho is presented as a gift from God. Notice the first two verses of chapter 6. Now Jericho was securely shut up because of the children of Israel. None went out. And none came in. And the Lord said to Joshua, See, I have given Jericho into your hand, its king and the mighty men of valor. God was to give Jericho to Israel. It was appropriate, of course, considering the seemingly impregnable nature of the two city walls. Now how God would <clears throat> instruct for Jericho to be taken really has no military value at all. It would be God's grace in giving Jericho that would make it possible for Israel to bring its conquest to the land. What lesson can we learn? Well, like Israel at Jericho, our conquest of the walls of sin must begin by God's grace given in Christ, who is the captain of our salvation. Hebrews chapter 2, verses 9 through 11. We read these verses. But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels, for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, <clears throat> might taste death for everyone. For it was fitting for him, for whom, all, uh, for whom are all things, and by whom are all things, in bringing many sons to glory, to make the captain, author, founder of their salvation perfect, through suffering. In verse 11, <clears throat> for both he who sanctifies and those who are being sanctified are all of one, for which reason he is not ashamed to call them brethren. Jericho's defeat <clears throat> is a lesson in conditional grace. Now, th though the religious world may have been taught to reject this biblical principle, the text reveals that there are conditions to be met for Israel to receive the gift of Jericho. Notice verses 3, 4, and 5 of, Jer of Joshua 6. You, sh <clears throat> you shall march around the city, all you men of war, 
You shall go around the city once. This was, of course, God's instructions. This you shall do in six days. And seven priests shall bear seven trumpets of ram's horns before the ark. For the seventh day you shall march around the city seven times, and the priest shall blow the trumpets. It shall come to pass that when you make a loud blast with the ram's horn, and when you hear the sound of the trumpet, that all the people shall shout with a great shout. Then the, then the walls of the city will fall down flat, and the people shall go up every man straight before. I have brought this morning a ram's horn. This ram's horn I bought in this old city of Jerusalem a number of years ago. This is a, a smaller one. They came much larger, of course. <clears throat> but this is a type of trumpet horn, ram's horn, so far, that was blown by the, um, by the Israelites. And then after that, they shouted as they marched around the city. Now, this ram's horn uh, was used not only for, to uh, commence a war, or of an army, but also, of course, for announcements and at weddings and so forth and so on. This ram's horn is, is very significant in the fact that God instructed the Israelites to blow this trumpet, this horn, this ram's horn, this shofar, and the city walls will fall. Now, it's interesting about the city walls. Uh, archaeologists have, have excavated this for a number of, of years on into the last century as well. And they have found that the city walls, the way they stood with the city up here, first retaining wall, the land, the second retaining wall, the walls fell outward. Because the Bible says, as we have just read, at the end of verse 5, and the people shall go up every man straight before, indicating that as the walls fell outward, the army of the Israelites would simply march up on the rubble and not on the uh, grassy area, march up on the rubble that had fallen from, these, from the city wall, the mud brick <clears throat> that, they, that they used to build these walls, and right up into the city. Now God laid down very specific instructions for what Israel was to do for the next seven days. It would only be after Israel did everything God said to do that the wall of the city will fall down flat, verse 5. Jericho was received as a gift when all of God's conditions, as, of course, Joshua pointed out near the end of the seventh day. There in verse 16, at the seventh time, when the priests blew the trumpets, Joshua said to the people, shout, for the Lord has given you the city. Did you catch that? Joshua encouraged the people to meet the final condition of the Lord and the final condition was shout for the Lord has given you the city meeting God's conditions did not change the fact that Jericho was still a gift of grace you know some lessons that we can learn again like Israel as recipients of God's grace that brings us victory over sin we must not assume that grace negates conditions that God might lay out for our reception of his grace. Read with me, if you will, in Hebrews chapter 5, verses 8 and 9. Although he was a son, he learned obedience from the things which he suffered. And having been made perfect, he became to all those who obey him the source of eternal salvation. So meeting his condition still means God saves us we work together with God. Notice what Romans chapter 6, verses 17 and 18 says. But thanks be to God that though you were slaves of sin, you became obedient from the heart to that form of teaching to which you were committed. And having been freed from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. Jer Jericho's defeat, <clears throat> I believe, is a study in acceptance of obedience. Israel did all God said to do just as God said to do it. We notice that in verses 6 through 16 of Joshua 6. Every detail of God's command was followed meticulously. As a result of their obedience, 
Joshua reminded the people that God had given them the city, verse 16. So Israel's complete obedience is emphasized, highlighting its importance in taking the city, chapter 6, verses 20 through 25. Another lesson that we can learn, acceptable obedience means we must do all that God has said to do as God has said to do it. There has never been any such thing as 90% obedience or any percentage of obedience. Obedience involves complete submission of our will to God and doing everything he says. Notice Deuteronomy 29, 29. The secret things belong to the Lord of our God, but the things revealed belong to us and to our sons forever. For we have observed all the words of his law. Matthew chapter 7, verse 21. <clears throat> now everyone, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father, who is in heaven, will enter. Joshua's uh, command was to follow God completely. Jericho's defeat is a lesson in sanctification as well. What does sanctification mean? Sanctification simply means to separate from the profane things and dedicate to God. This is what God demanded of Israel when they received the gift of Jericho, chapter 6, 17 through 19. No spoils and no one except Rahab's family were to be saved. Verse 17, <clears throat> only things of silver gold bronze and iron were to be kept and dedicated to God and to place, be placed in God's treasury. Verse 19, to covet and to keep the spoils would make the Israelite camp accursed and tr bring trouble. Verse 18, lesson, like Israel, our reception of grace includes the necessity of continual sanctification. Notice Romans 6, 1 and 2. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin so that grace may increase? May it never be. How shall we who died to sin still live in it? What about Hebrews 12, 14? The Bible reads, Pursue peace with all men and the sanctification without which no one will see the Lord. Jericho's defeat is a lesson in faith. Jericho was received from God by faith, Hebrews 11.30. By faith, the walls of Jericho fell down after they had been encircled for seven days. That faith was seen in their following God's battle plan of encircling around the city for seven days that had no real military value. How strange it must have been to have taken a look at the people there in Jericho as they watched how strangely they watched Israel walk around the city once every day and walking around the city would take about 75 minutes, about an hour and a quarter, and for six days and then go on to their tents. Without faith, how strange God's plan would have been to the Israelites who despite having overwhelming military numbers are instead walking around the city. Their faith that led them to obey plus God's grace came all together on the seventh day. And on the seventh lap, the walls fell flat, just as God had promised. What about a lesson for us today from this? Like Israel, our reception of God's saving grace requires faith strong enough to obey. Do not miss the lesson of faith that's presented by Jericho. Notice Hebrews 11.30. By faith, the walls of Jericho fell down after they had encircled seven days. <clears throat> faith was why God destroyed the walls, but only after Israel showed their faith to be strong enough to obey his commands, his conditions. And like Israel, true biblical faith, or faith that obeys, presents, of course, us as a spectacle to the world. God's people of faith are spectacles to the world. 1 Corinthians 4, 9 and 10. For I thank God has exhibited us 
apostles, last of all, as men condemned to death because we have become a spectacle to the world, both to the angels and to men. We are fools for God's sake, but you are prudent in Christ. We are weak, but you are strong. You are distinguished, but we are without honor. The world maligns how our faith makes us different. Notice 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 3 and 4. For the time already <clears throat> passed is sufficient for you to have carried out the desires of the Gentiles, having pursued a course of sensuality, lust, drunkenness, carousings, drinking, parties, and abominable idolatries. With respect to this, they are surprised when you do not join them in some flood of debauchery, and they malign you. When the end of this life has come and this world has come uh, to an end and destruction is rained down upon the wicked and unbelieving, the wisdom of having faith that obeys God will be known by all. It was Rahab's faith that acted, that saved her and her family. Notice Hebrews eleven thirty one, By faith, Rahab the harlot did not perish along with those who were disobedient after she had welcomed the spies in peace. Now I remind you of God's promise in 2 Thessalonians 1, 6, 7, and 8. For after all, it is only just for God to repay with affliction those who afflict you and to give relief to you who are afflicted to us as well. When the Lord Jesus will be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, dealing out retribution to those who do not know God and to those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. So what is our conclusion here? Number one, I hope we have learned some lessons from Jericho's defeat and like Israel, I believe we will. Be thankful, number one, for God's needed grace to overcome your, your walls, your insurmountable walls of sin. Be determined to accept God's condition that we might receive his grace. Thirdly, seek to obey God completely in meeting his conditions. Fourthly, accept that deliverance by grace it requires that we be sanctified or separate from this world. Fifthly, know that faith in God that brings his victorious grace is faith that acts, faith that obeys God. If you have learned these lessons and are outside of Christ, the Lord calls you to put faith, put your faith, to put your trust in Christ and the grace he brings and respond to the gospel invitation to the Lord's invitation by repenting, confessing, being baptized in that watery grave of baptism. So as to be raised a, in newness of life, God in grace provides the means of your salvation through his son, the captain of our salvation, who died on the cross to open the way to eternal life in heaven for you. Will you respond to God and submit in faith to Jesus today and be baptized for the remission of your sins? If you have questions, and if you wish for someone to study the Bible with you and study further the contents of the Bible and answer your questions, please contact us here at the Church of Christ in Montgomery, Alabama, 5315 Atlanta Highway. Or you may call the church office at 334-334. 386-7320, and someone will assist you. Thank you for joining us today in this study of God's Word. Shall we pray? Our Heavenly Father, we pray that we'll all be diligent students of your Word. Thank you for this opportunity that we've had to bring forth the truth, your simple eternal truth, and the lessons we can learn about the conquest of Jericho. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.